Welcome to Just Another Hunting Podcast. This is Steve with Mountain to Coast Outdoors in collaboration with Joseph from Way Out West Adventures. We dive deep into the world of hunting, exploring tactics, gear, and unforgettable stories from the field. Join us each week as we interview seasoned experts and passionate enthusiasts who share insights and experiences to help you enhance your hunting skills. Whether you're a novice seeking guidance or a veteran hunter looking for new challenges, this is your go-to resource for all things hunting. Tune in each week to step up your game and to connect with the community who shares your love for the great outdoors. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode. Today we have Owen on with Seek Outside. And uh, we're going to talk everything backcountry tents and backpacking. So, Owen, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do for Seek, and we'll get into this thing. Yeah. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm Owen. I work in marketing and design over at Seek Outside. Um, pretty cool job. Been there for over six years now. So <clears throat> I've done everything from the seam sealing, so very basic uh, manufacturing process, all the way up to where I'm at now. So it's been a lot of fun. Right on, man. Well, I think I've probably been using your shelters then about as long as you've been working there. I, w- I think that's about, I've been five or six years using the, the Cimarron and then yeah. uh, got the Red Cliff and the DST Tarp and now the Dyneema version of both of those. So mm-hmm. I've been using your guys' stuff for quite a while now. Yeah. Well, yeah, I remember looking because I started running an Instagram and I'd see you tag us and stuff like all the time. So I was like, I had known before you had reached out to work with us, I had known who you were. So it's pretty easy to be like, I've, I've seen your content. It's pretty uh, straightforward, you know? <laughs> yeah. I got to admit, it was pretty rough when I first started, but uh, learning as I go. Yeah. Aren't we all? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I was, I'm interested um, in the backpacking tent world. What are the, what are the fabrics? Obviously Dyneema is a really popular one now, but um, I see all different kinds of nylon being used nowadays. I'm, what's the difference between them and the kind of the pros and cons of one or the other? Yeah, for sure. So there's like mainly when it comes down to like tent fabrics, you have sill nylon, which is primarily what we, we use. There's sill poly, which is a silicone polyester. And then there's Dyneema. Um, Dyneema is definitely the most expensive, but it's a very high end fabric. It doesn't sag or stretch at all. Um, it's very, very strong, <clears throat> uh, does really well in terrible weather. It's pretty much, a, you, it's pretty high end. Um, I think you've probably seen like just going from, you had the Cimarron, which is in Sil Nylon and Dyneema. Um, so you mm-hmm. can choose either option. Um, you can probably tell a little bit of a difference when it comes to like some sag or in the wind, like it pitches real nice and tight. Uh, so the Dyneema is real cool. Um, have you, what, what like kind of differences have you noticed yourself using it? I'd say that was probably the main thing was this year we took that Dyneema Cimarron on a spring bear hunt, uh, you know, like mid April. So whether we had everything from sun to rain and wind, you know, and in, uh, for one pitching, it was nice and tight. Like there's, like you said, there's zero sag. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when you're sleeping at night, you get that condensation on the shelter, no matter like what shelter you have. So the tent's going to sag a little bit, you know, overnight with the, the moisture weight. And that shelter didn't sag really at all that I can, I can remember. So, um, that was definitely a nice feature, you know, being able to sit up a little bit more in the tent and not get condensation on you first thing in the morning. Um, and then in the wind, man, we went through a gnarly windstorm. We were camped on a ridge where we could glass into both, uh, two different basins. So we were obviously kind of set up in the wind and, uh, that thing held up in the wind, no problem at all. So I was definitely impressed. Yeah, the Dyneema is pretty sweet, and I don't know if I mentioned it, but obviously for anybody listening, it's also quite a bit lighter, about the lightest fabric you can get into. So I think like in the case of like the Cimarron, it takes you from, with all your poles and stakes, like a three and a half pound tent to almost a two and a half or a little less than two and a half pounds. So it saves you quite a bit of, of weight. Um, so it's kind of the go-to for the high end. The problem is it's generally about <clears throat> twice the price of like, a nylon or a polyester tent. Yeah. But to me, I mean, as much as I hunt, it's, it's worth the money. It's worth the investment. I mean, I know I'm going to use it for years and years and years. So, yeah. um, I mean, I think the canopy weighs like 17 ounces, just the shelter. Yeah. No sticks. 
yeah, it's, it's tiny. I mean, it's super light. So pretty much like I can run my Cimarron Dyneema version and then the DST tarp and Dyneema. And it's like the same weight as the, the Sil Nylon Cimarron, right? Yeah. So you can kind of leave your, your spike camp or base camp, whatever you want to use it for set up and then just take that T or that uh, tarp with you that way. I don't even know what that thing weighs. Nothing pretty much. And, yeah. uh, Good to go. yeah yeah so I, I love it i mean it is spendy but a lot of guys are die hard so i'm sure they can afford a three thousand dollar rifle and a thousand dollar backpack and four hundred dollar boots i'm sure they can afford the, the tent if they want it bad enough exactly you just gotta like kind of invest into what you're into right like so like I, I do a lot of like first season in colorado elk hunts or like backcountry deer hunts I'm packing that all in. Um, so I got myself a Dyneema Cimarron, which I was lucky to. And a funny, a funny story. Um, I took it out first night ever and I set it up and I had my pack inside. And I was like starting to take stuff out of my pack and I had my trekking poles and they were in the pocket of my backpack and I pulled on them and they like didn't want to come out. And then they finally came out and I just punched a hole straight through my brand new Dyneema tent. And I was, that one hurt quite a bit. It's like poke a hole in it? Yeah. It was like oh. brand new, brand new Dyneema tent. And look at what I just did. Good job. But the cool oh. thing about Dyneema is it's super easy to repair. Um, so Dyneema is, they have like tape and you just stick that on there. It's a whole other piece of Dyneema. It's like the simplest thing to repair because when you get down to, I guess moving on, we'll go from Dyneema to the siliconized. Um, so the nylon and the polyester, nothing really sticks to silicone at all. So you can't just take like a repair patch or it doesn't really stick reliably, I guess. You can't just take this patch and put it on there and be done. Like generally there has to be, um, they're a little bit harder to repair. Usually it takes a little bit of sewing or some crafty use of like the silicone seam sealer um, <clears throat> to repair those. So the Dyneema, the Dyneema is cool, I guess is the... <laughs> fun end of the story here um but yeah moving on to nylon and polyester those are like your most common that's what you're going to see in anything from you know tents like the msr hubba hubba um like those you know dome styled shelters all the way up to big teepees like we make um and <clears throat> the nylon has been around for a really really long time um often thought of as quite a bit stronger um but there's also some disadvantages and stuff in between the materials like nylon technically absorbs a smidge of water which it really shouldn't do the silicone i guess we're getting into the nitty here but that's why you get a little bit more sag when you get like a bunch of heavy rain on a nylon versus a polyester um so yeah there's a bunch of different options the polyesters are like generally thought of as a little bit less strong um they're generally in the, at least in the tent world, they're in a less denier, which is like your thread count. So they're a little bit less thread, uh, thick threads. Um, so yeah, there's people in the hot tent industry that use polyester. There's people who use nylon. Um, we're pretty much only going to use nylon um, for the time being, just because we've done an, a numerous amount of tests and we just found like our, our nylon is custom made for us. It's incredibly strong. That's why we can make 16 person TVs out of the same nylon we make the Cimarron out of and they'd be able to hold up to 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Uh, so we try and I guess use a material that's going to, that you can fly in on a Alaska hunt with nasty winds, heavy rain, a uh, bunch of crap, and it's not really going to fail out there on you. All right, guys, quick interruption. If you like the show and you want to help us out a little bit and save some money, make sure you head over to the show notes at the end of this episode. We have discount codes for you guys with Seek Outside, Dark Energy, Go Hunt, Slayer Calls, and Mountain Tough Training. All right, back to the episode. I mean, for me, it, you guys definitely seem to be the kind of some of the first guys in the backcountry hunting space, those floorless teepees that I was seeing everywhere, all over social media and YouTube, you guys definitely seem to, in my opinion, kind of pave the way from what I can tell with that style shelter. Yeah. So. I, mean, I would say so, especially like we weren't the first people to do it. There's other, other brands who uh, made shelters like floorless shelters and hot tent shelters before, but um, we definitely 
cleaned up the design really well and put our own engineering into it. Like most of our stuff pitches so incredible, all of our stuff uh, pitches incredibly well. Like you don't have any seams or, or panels that have a bunch of like waviness in them. They all pitch really tight. And that's just a product of good designers and uh, good, good ideas that we carried out. And uh, yeah, so it <laughs> works out. And we've been in the game, I guess, 14 years now. We started in 2010. So we've been around quite a bit. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I like about the Simran, not to keep, you know, talking about the same shelter, but yeah. it's so simple to pitch. Basically, those those four corners make a square or a rectangle. Mm-hmm. And then you and the center pull up, pitch the sides out. Those two side side or those two, you know, one stake on each side of the center pull and you're done. It's really simple. Yeah. And really roomy. I mean, I think it's like six foot tall in the middle. So plenty of room for two guys. I'm six two. My brother's six foot, I believe. And 200 pound range with all of our gear and a stove. I mean, it gets a little tight with a stove, but it's totally doable with wood in there and everything. So I, I think it's super hard to beat personally. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the size is, that's like, the Cimarron is our most popular shelter, hands down. Um, it's got, it's like the perfect size, you know, you can run it as a single person shelter. It's not like overly mm-hmm. heavy. It's still only three and a half pounds. And, um, you know, you have some like, you have some sitting room in there, which is nice. And then two people with a stove and some gear is not out of this world. You know, it's not a hard thing to do. So it's uh, it's very popular. I know we had, uh, I worked the customer service line too. We had some guy where his tent failed. Um, they were out like in just a nasty windstorm and they ended up sleeping like four guys in the Cimarron with the stove. So yeah, props up to them. That's a yeah. lot of people. That's pretty tight. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. you got to do what you got to do. So Yeah, exactly. So another one I wanted to ask you about is I did a Nevada high country mule deer hunt last year. And uh, my buddy Garrett loaned me the Eolus with the nest. Yeah. Um, and then I see the Silex which looks similar in design, but I've never actually put my hands on the Silex. So um, it looks like the Eolus has been discontinued for quite a while. Now I'm curious, like what, what is the different, the general differences kind of just like the main keys between the uh, Eolus and the uh, Silex? Yeah. So the Eolus and the Silex really just, I guess there's a few different things that change. So the Eolus was meant to be like a three season shelter. Um, It was never meant to have a stove jack in it. And one of the things <clears throat> we call it a feature, I guess, like at least in our intent, is that it pitched off the ground. It was never able to like pitch all the way down. And the reason for that was that you'd have airflow, so you'd have less condensation. Because single wall shelters, I mean, it's not sleeping in a cabin, but <laughs> you get you yeah. get condensation. I've I've had rooftop tents and even been in an airstream. You know, they they all everything gets condensation. So. Um, but yeah, the, the difference between the Eolus, yeah, it never pitched down to the ground all the way um, so that you could have some air flow go through it. So condensation was kind of like a, a dummy proof little design there, you know, so you'd always have some air flow because you can pitch, like if you pitch the Silex all the way down to the ground and you're one person sleeping in there on wet grass, like it's going to be pretty condensated in the morning. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was that. And then the Eolus is like meant to be a two person shelter. I think it was. I think the Eolus was our first shelter with the zipperless doors, um, the patented zipperless doors. And then the Silex came next. The Silex is a one person. We call it a one and a half. Like it's pretty roomy for a one person. You could sleep two smaller guys in there pretty easily. Um, but it has the stove jack. Um, so you can run a real small stove in there, dry your gear out. It's kind of a cool, um, like going, like late September archery up in Colorado, like you want to go super light and small, but you still need like still gets cold at night, you know, and you want to dry stuff out or stay warm for a little bit in the morning. So those are the main differences. And both of them have the option for a nest, which is just an insert. So they're as as they sit, they're just four of the shelters. Um, the nests, uh, that's your floor, your bug netting, and DWR, which protects you from condensation. Yeah, I like that. That nest feature in the Eolus was pretty sweet in the high country in Nevada. 
you know, early August, there were bugs everywhere, no matter where you, where you went low, high, middle, there were bugs all over the place. So I definitely like that feature. And I think those are those line locks, you call them on the bottom where you can, you can adjust the pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Our line, the line locks there. Um, so you can adjust, you can raise the tent off the ground or bring it down closer. Yeah. I like, I like that feature a lot, being able to kind of like stake it out pretty snug, but then like really pull on those line locks and like suck that thing down really nice and tight. It was that thing pitched beautiful as well. And then the zipperless doors, um, I got to admit, I was like a little skeptical at how well that would work, but you slide that thing up and it doesn't move one bit. Like it doesn't come back down at all. I think that that's a hell of a design. Yeah, no, it's sweet. Um, it's been pretty popular. And I mean, everybody knows who's been in the back country a long time, like zippers just fail. Like <clears throat> it happens no matter what quality you use. So the zipper list is like, you can just take a little bit of extra cordage with you, which you probably have, especially if you're out there hunting. Um, yeah. And so you just, you know, that if your cordage fails or somehow gets cut, you just replace that cordage and you're good to go. Yeah. If you're hunting, you definitely probably have at least 50 feet of cordage in your pack to hang quarters or exactly. whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Right on. So, um, you guys, when you like go to design a shelter, I mean, how do you, how do you guys decide like how big to go? Like one man, two, or, two man, four man, six man, or you just trying to like make sure you have a shelter for every scenario or do you have preference towards like group sizes when you guys put a new design out? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we build stuff we want to use, I guess. So like we all are like hunters or, you know, outdoor enthusiasts in some sort of way. Like we all like camping, getting out in the woods, whether it's backpacking, fishing, hunting biking all everything in between um so we kind of build stuff that's like we want like the new the sunlight is a shelter that replaced the eolus and that was a shelter that like i personally wanted i was like i want a two-person sewn in floor and bug netting you know with the zipperless doors real light um because it makes your pack size quite a bit smaller so stuff like i was doing like i was doing like bike packing or hiking up to go fish like up high mountain lake and i just wanted some real small but the bugs suck as you know up high and so that was kind of like <clears throat> that's where we start and then um we usually get like some rough numbers you know we'll be like well we needed to sleep you know somebody up to like six foot six um and we want it to you know you take your standard pad length like we build a lot of our shelters are a little bit bigger than probably like the industry standard standard like if you take like a Hilleberg one person, you take our one person, you're going to be a lot more roomy in ours. Um, and a lot of that comes from being floorless because we have more space, right? Like you, you can make a lighter shelter that has more floor space because there's no floor. Um, so yeah, you kind of take that and you're like, all right, you take your pad sections, your width, and then you add a little bit there and then choose your height. You want it to be a trekking pole shelter, choose your height there. So like 50 inches and then we uh, generally like make the first proto. And so that happens like with the bigger shelters too. Like it's kind of trying to find like, have you seen our courthouse? Oh yeah. Like you're, it's pretty much your guys' like quote unquote wall tent, but much lighter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we use all, we use all the stuff almost every other weekend. And uh, you know, like one of the new shelters we're working on is something that's, supposed to be big and comfy you know because we use the courthouse a lot and you're like oh, we need like ideas start to form ideas start to form and we take some numbers and uh our in-house designer puts it in the i think cad and then draws out a pattern and sews it together we look at it and we're like oh, i don't know we don't like this don't like this it needs to be you know because numbers only mean so much you end up getting angles right um that are like all right man we, we could angle this out so it's bigger inside and so on and so forth. So uh, that's basically how it starts. And then we just do generally a few protos and we get to a point where everybody signs off on something and uh, we start to bring it to production, which usually takes like four to six weeks because we got to train all the sellers and all that fun stuff. Wow. It's quite the process. So do you guys like prototype them or send them out to people to test for a certain amount of time before you like put them up for sale type of thing or 
is it all maybe shelter by shelter just based on how you guys feel about it right off the bat? Yeah, it's definitely shelter by shelter a little bit. Example that like sunlight, um, we had, that one took a good year for us to like from start to finish. We made, you know, we tried a bunch of different designs. We even tried to do a zipperless interior door. Um, so there was just no zippers on the tent at all, like for like the nest. Um, so that one takes about like, a, that one took us about a year. We finally had something that was like pretty dang close with like the dimensions and all that stuff. Um, just kind of dial in a few things. And we sent that out to a few people because it's more of a backpacky, like three season tent. We sent them out to people who are like doing, hiking a lot, doing a lot of camping that stuff. And then we use it ourselves. Some of the, it's kind of a fun part of the job is generally, if we're lucky, like design starts like now. We're like, all right, let's start working on this tent. And then by like February, March, um, we have like a, a pretty good working proto that we're like, this is pretty close to the final design. So one of the chests for the sunlight, I, a big winter storm, like winter spring storm was coming in and I like drove just car camped out of it just to kind of test it. Like we had like 45 mile an hour winds and it was great. So it was like kind of a fun, those are fun perks of the job. You get to like go use the gear as part of the uh, experience, you know, part of the part of work in there. Yeah. So what is the sunlight way? I forget. Uh, it was definitely one I was looking at as well for those high country hunts. Uh, I've kind of got a itch to go try to kill a high country mule deer in the velvet with my bow, which I haven't done yet. But uh, yeah. after that trip last year, I was really looking at that sunlight. And then a couple of my buddies at work have been looking at that one as well. So I was curious, what does that thing weigh? So with eight steaks, I think it's 39 ounces. So just like over two pounds. Just like over two yeah, pounds. just barely over two pounds. Yeah. So, that's, so, and you can trekking pole pitch that thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty dang light then. Yeah, it's not wow. bad at all. And it, it packs down real small. It's <clears throat> definitely, I wouldn't be taking it out like dead of winter compared to like some of the other shows. Yeah. Um, but it's a fantastic three season shelter. It does everything. So Nice. Yeah, I might have to check that thing out one of these days. Yeah. I, I'd recommend it's probably that and the Cimarron are my most used. Uh, the Cimarron, yeah. the Sunlight, and the Eight Burst of Sleepy Yellow. My go to is everything. Yeah. My wife's not a huge fan of sleeping on the dirt. Um, I took her up last year. We hiked up into the snow and slept on the snow and in the Cimarron. And yeah. uh, she wasn't a big fan of the Florida shelter at first. She, it grew on her after a few days, but. I was thinking about, you know, that sunlight again, that, that has the sun and bathtub floor, right? So yep. that would probably be a, a good one for the family. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the cool thing is a little sneak peek, I guess, but we have floors coming out for like the Cimarron and the Red Cliff too. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So there'll be in August, the Cimarron floor will come out and then the Red Cliff floor will follow a little later. Uh, that's been a big thing we've tried to do for all of our shelters lately is designing like floors and floor systems. And we have a pretty unique, I don't know if you've ever seen for the eight person TP and the new twilight shelter we have. Uh, it's a floor, but there's a liner that comes up like half, like a third of the tent. So when you're sleeping on the ground and you roll your sleeping bag into the shelter, you don't get your sleeping bag wet. And then oh. it also doubles because you can lift the shelter off the ground and you don't get any drafts, but you still get the airflow to move in because there's that, oh, that would be barrier there. So will you be able to run a stove with that setup? Yep. Yep. So we do with the floors, we have a, I don't know exactly what it is. I want to call it Kevlar, but I don't think it is it's like a reflective fire mat that you can put down on the, on the floors and that radiates all the heat back up. Um, obviously there's some, like if you run a stove and, an ember pops out, like you might put a small hole in your floor, but our, our, our material doesn't burn, obviously. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's all good to go. Well, I mean, you kind of got to expect that when you got a, when you're running a stove in your shelter, that there's a chance. I mean, I've popped holes in my sleeping bag. I've got patches all over my sleeping bag. I've yeah. rolled into the stove. I've, I've got holes in my 
puffy coat. Like it's, you kind of got to, you know, have a little common sense. It's, it's stuff's going to get beat up a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Like our, uh, I did a trip up like 10,000 feet in March. So there's just tons of snow and it was, uh, we camped up there. We like skied in camped, brought steaks and stuff. Like we were living, living good. And, um, we were just sleeping on the, on the snow, but the snow turned to ice because we started the fire inside the tent and we're hanging out and the snow turned to ice. And I was just ever so slightly on this angle. And I have a, a nice, like, Western mountaineering sleeping bag that I love to death. <laughs> I remember getting, like, woken up in the morning, like, it's like 3 a.m. I'm like, you're on the stove. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Feathers <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. And I was like, God dang it, dude. This <laughs> is my favorite sleeping bag. They aren't cheap by any means. So No, um, I looked at them. They are expensive. I was hurt. But luckily, you could patch it. Um and it was the damage wasn't too bad, but yeah, the stove, you know, there's an inherent risk of having a very hot piece of titanium in your in your tent. Um, I've lost lost some hunting pants to it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, but my buddy Joseph got me. Uh, I got to give him credit for it. He found uh, a llama guy and uh, picked up a couple three males. Um, they're, they're babies. They're like two months old right now, but right. got three males coming this January. So every night after work, not every night, but most nights I've been working on building a fence and a shed or like a lean to kind of thing for them. But, uh, just been thinking about all the luxurious things I'm going to be able to pack into the back country, bigger, like maybe a Dyneema red cliff, bigger stove, like a lightweight frying pan, some steaks, you know, a couple beverages, <laughs> just living a little bit more comfortable back there here in the near future. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. That'll be nice. Switch out the whiskey for a few beers. And stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We had, uh, uh, when I was growing up hunting, uh, my family got a few goats. Yeah. That was awesome. Except for they were like, they were already pretty fully grown. They had to be a couple of years old and they were very unruly. Like every time we get into like real steep, nasty stuff, they would just, Nope. They just like would not budge. They'd turn around, hike down, and just wait at the bottom. <laughs> so it didn't last super long, unfortunately. But like hiking into more mellow stuff, they were pretty good about like, you know, packing in and bringing in nice stuff um, like beers, bringing like a six pack. I'm still carrying, you know, like 40 pounds on my back, but to have yeah. the, the goats carry the luxuries is the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm honestly like, I don't know how this is going to work out, right? Because I've never done it before. Um, but I'm hoping it works out. <laughs> I'm hoping it's, you know, a game changer, I guess you'd say. But we'll yeah. see. I, I think I get, I'll get out of them what I put into them if I train them well enough. Finding time for that will be tricky with the kids and stuff. But I'm looking forward to trying it. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. I feel like since you're, like, getting them as, like, babies, it's going to be a better setup anyways. So I hope. I got to... I can walk out of my, my door and do like a four and a half mile loop. Nice. I mean, it's not like super steep. It only climbs like, I think 800 feet throughout the whole thing up and down. But I think it'd be a good spot to kind of like just get them broken in, you know? Yeah. Get them in shape. I think I lost you there for a second. What did you say again? Oh, I said I can walk right out of my front door here and do like a four and a half mile loop. And uh, it gains like 800 feet of elevation. So it's definitely not steep, but it'll be a good place to kind of break them in, you know, kind of get them trained a little bit. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to bringing them to Colorado. I've got uh, a handful of points now and I've been kind of like him and Han if I'm going to apply for third season or second season, because you yeah. can get second season. They're obviously, they're not in the rut yet. So you can get a tag a little bit easier and a, more premier area, if you will. Mm -hmm. But now that I've got these llamas kind of in the hopper, I'm like, man, do I just wait a few more years until they're ready to pack and then go in somewhere deep, like third season and try to kill a real big buck? Or I've been uh, kind of kicking that around, like not sure what to do really. I want to go. I don't want to, I don't want to wait forever to like draw a hunt, but I'm going to have to wait forever again kind of thing, you know? So I'm like, what to do? It's, it's yeah. always hard. I don't know how it is. Like, cause I've never, I guess I've never, aside from Alaska, I've never hunted out of state. Um, 
but I know like the points are insane. Like for me, there's a unit that I've been saving up for, um, for uh, like high country mule deer, um, but rifle, so like second or third rifle. And <clears throat> I like the points, it's like only like three points, but it feels like forever for me. I'm like, come on, man. Because next year, <laughs> next year I should have the amount of points to get after it. And it's like, just my dream hunt because I've been out there, you know, just hanging out, like fishing and stuff like that. And just seeing the biggest box. I'm like, oh man, I want to do like when it comes to elk hunting. Like I, you know, a lot of it's like about me for me. You know, like I get a cow tag. I'm not super worried about getting a bull or anything, or I'll get like a first season rifle either sex. Yeah, and just kind of get what I get. Like it's already hard enough to find them. But the deer, I just have a romanticization of like chasing bucks, like deep, deep in the back country, up high, fully just living like quiet in the tent, maybe have a buddy, full solo, yeah. like style and stuff, you know, like be up in them is kind of the goal. <laughs> yeah, I'm jealous, man. Yeah, I mean, I haven't killed any like real big mule deer. I've killed a couple of four by fours, but nothing that, you know, scores really well. So I've had that itch lately. Like I elk were primarily what I love to chase with a bow during the rut. Like who doesn't like bugling elk, right? But um yeah. something about trying to kill a mature mule deer just has, you know, it's so hard to do, at least for me yeah. anyway. They're hard yeah. to find, dude. They're sneaky. When they're that big, they're pretty dang smart. They're like, they get around the woods pretty well, in my opinion. Yeah. The box I and most of... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say the, the box I've chased after, like, I've spent you know, five days. Like, I've seen them during elk season, you know, like maybe I hunted second elk, and then I go hunt third deer. I'm like, I know exactly where the deer was. And they just know. They have a, they have a sense for sure that I have a tag. When I don't have one, I had a. It was the year I had a deer tag for third and elk for second. I see, <clears throat> I was hunting, I think, I had a bull tag and I saw this just rack come over the hill. And I was, that's, that's a four point buck, like no way, it's, or not buck, a uh, four point like bull. And I was like getting ready, I was like, fuck down, you know, my buddy. Man, <laughs> it's a deer, this is massive deer. And I was like, definitely coming right back to this spot. Hunted that whole area for a couple of days. I didn't even see a deer. I saw like maybe a few does. Yeah. Aggravating. <laughs> yeah. Similar story. I was when I was in Nevada last year, I saw one bruiser monster four by four to me anyway, like a really nice buck. Yeah. And uh, he, he came out of the saddle just before dark with another buck, another pretty nice buck, but not quite as big. Yeah. And I watched them feed until it was dark up over the saddle. And they just kind of milled around, didn't go very far at all. Came back the next morning, glassed that all day, nothing. Never saw that deer again. Came back the next day, glassed that spot for like three days straight, light to dark. Never saw that deer again. Just that one night. I'm That's like, <laughs> they just, he just a appeared. And then I never saw him again. <laughs> They're like mythical creatures. Yeah, it's it's wild how they can do that but yeah i like the deer hunting because generally you at least see deer you know like yeah maybe once a day you'll see even if it's a spike or something gets you going gets you excited but the, the elk hunting i mean i've hunted five six days straight and i've seen one and then you kind of get kind of get broken a little bit back there yeah i gotta go back to town and go resupply have a night in my own bed go back up and this is like I've had so many times where it's the last end of shooting light, last day. I come into like a big old meadow. There's an elk there, and then they just spook. <laughs> just like, <laughs> oh, what a rough cut week this has been. <laughs> <laughs> so, as a non-resident in Washington, I've obviously been eyeballing Colorado for a long time, but it does seem like it gets hunted pretty hard with the unlimited over-the-counter tags. And it's like the first Western state from the Midwest. Is it as bad as it seems in your opinion in the areas you hunt? Is it pretty, pretty pressured or? I mean, definitely over the years, I think hunting has become more popular. I don't know. I think there's an influencing thing to it. And like kind of a get back to wild recently over the last couple of years. So 
um, the area I used to hunt <clears throat> growing up, it was just us and an outfitter, and the outfitter didn't go into the wilderness. And so we were hunting wilderness, and we would see elk every other day or just, like know exactly where they were going to be. It was pretty high success rate, pretty like if you can get close to them. Um, and then at like probably 2021 when I went up there to hunt, because uh, I hunt a couple different units now. I don't live there, but um, yeah, it was like 25 cars at the trailhead. So there's definitely, you have to go deeper than you ever have, and you have to be able to out hike them, which is a pain in the butt because. <laughs> I don't want to hike six miles back, I mean, seven miles back in gnarly country, but if I have to, I guess I will. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't think it's a lot of the people are ATV hunters. You know, a lot of the people are out of state guys who brought their razor in and ATVs, especially during archery and stuff. So I feel like it's not. If you're fit enough and you have the know-how to go like deeper into the backcountry, you can still get into them pretty well. There's just definitely pressure, like you know, anywhere within a few miles of a road. Um, there's definitely quite a bit more pressure than there used to be, at least when I grew up hunting here. But the cool, cool thing, and probably not a cool thing. I don't know. I don't want to offend anybody from not in Colorado, but you can't get over-the-counter. Um, I think archery. You can't get over-the-counter archery as an out-of-state resident. Or just in general. So for deer? For I think elk and deer, yeah. I thought the elk was over the counter for archery, but I, I thought that mule deer was a draw only. Well they, for, they, for just, they they just changed it this year or they're gonna change it next year. That there's no I think more. they're gonna change it next year is what I what I or they're gonna I don't know if it passed yet or not, but I I heard they were gonna get away from the OTC stuff. Yeah, I think for out of state it'll be draw only. And I think that, I mean, there's still a ton of allocated tags. Over the last, I think if I was looking at pressure, like there was definitely a buildup towards like COVID times and then everybody started going outside. Um, and in that time period, like 2020, 21 was like terrible. Like so many people out outdoors, um, which, you know, we're all doing the same thing. So you can't be too upset about it. But over the last couple of years, I've seen it wane off quite a bit. There's been, especially in hunting, like so many more leftover tags than there, mm -hmm. there was before. So like, I don't know if it's, yeah, people are just not as into hunting as they were, or they're going to different states or what it is. But yeah, tons of leftover tags. Like um, I could just easily go grab one if I wanted to. Yeah, my brother and I were talking about that exact thing like two hours ago that from some of the guys we talk to, like with go hunt and stuff that do this stuff for a living, you know, the tag allocation stuff in all the States, they were pr predicting that a lot of these units, a lot of these States are going to, they like plateaued, right. With like their point creep, not, yeah. not like obviously every state or, or every hunt, but a lot of them. Yeah. And uh, it does seem like there was that big spike during COVID. A lot of people got into it for like that year or two. And those people are starting to kind of slowly fade back off again. Yeah. So for my own selfish reasons, I kind of hope that's the trend. So there's not as much competition out there, but, um, I don't know. I just, Colorado, just everyone talks about the pressure, the people, you know, there's people yeah. everywhere. I've never been yet. So I've always wondered if it's really that bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's too bad. I guess I've grown up doing it. Um, but yeah, you just kind of got to get after it. You escape, you escape the roads and where ATVs can go and you're pretty much going to if you're if you're hiking on single track and you're putting in a few miles, you're gonna get away from most people. Um, the funny thing uh, that's like going up back to like the units, like I've, I've hunted growing up and everything, and like hiking in four or five miles and then just seeing a seeing seek outside tents out there, you know, from guys who like I'm gonna talk to him. I, mean, I joke about like I'm gonna go help this guy like fix his pitch, you know, like so, yeah you tend a little bit better buddy <laughs> so it's it's cool to like see like where i grew up see all the you know seek outside tents out there um in the back of tree for hunting it's been awesome have you ran into anybody that's like ever recognized you back there from doing uh, like the youtube video because i think you're like one of the only guys i ever see do the seek outside youtube videos i am mostly i do most of the youtube videos uh my coworker ryan does some too um 
he's a he's a real habit hunter as well. Um, but yeah, mostly just on that. I haven't had anybody. <clears throat> I've had a few people like at uh, events and stuff. Be like, oh, you're the guy from the video. Like, yeah, I am. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> but I have. I went to hike like a 14er uh, on the fourth of July, and I was hiking up, and there's some guy with a seek outside backpack, and I was like. Hey, that's a nice backpack. You know, thank you. I love it. He was, he was like, I, I work at Seagull Club. And I ended up being the one who sold it to him like five years ago on the phone. Um, oh. for a service. So it was kind of a cool, he's like, oh, yeah, your voice sounded familiar and all that stuff. Um, it's cool to see it all out in the field and like make those connections again. Cause our, our customer service is pretty intimate. You know, it's not like I'm the guy who's, I've ran the stuff for, you know, like over six years now and I'm still talking to everybody and everybody wears so many hats there and cool, cool place. Yeah. So where are you guys based out of again in Colorado? We're in Grand Junction, Colorado. So like Western where the roads are named about, are like for how far away from the Utah border you are. Does that makes sense. Oh, okay. 24 road, 24 miles from Utah. 26 <laughs> so that's like the the whole town uh it's just based on a grid like that um but yeah we're real close to utah like an hour and a half from moab um but right like it's desert meets desert meets the mountains meets, you know big mountains and just any kind of environment you could want within a two-hour drive you know from big red sandstone rocks to <clears throat> you know being on a 14 or so it doesn't get super cold. It's like negative 10 is the coldest I've ever seen it, which is very cold here. And then like 15 degrees is generally like how cold it is in the morning in January. So it's pretty nice. You get like a warmer area and then you got mountains and desert and everywhere you could ever go play around on. So, and just fantastic hunting. Super close to. So, yeah. yeah. I got to come check it out here soon. Yeah. If you're ever in the area, you definitely need to stop by the shop and see all the all the sewing and all the cutting, all the, all the manufacturing we do. It's definitely, yeah. I think people come in, you know, because we have like a, a little retail space. I think people come in just expecting it to be, you know, like your average like retail outdoor store and then you just see like a whole building of manufacturing. It's probably, it's probably cool. I just think it's, fun. it's pretty rare that people make stuff in the U.S. anymore, especially yeah, that's gear true. like that. Yeah. No, I definitely would swing by for sure. When I do come through, I'm going to stop by either yeah. on the way in or on the way out, one or the other. Perfect. Hopefully with a big bull or a big buck in your truck bed. <laughs> that'll, be the, that'll definitely be the goal. Yeah. All right, man. Well, it's been 45 minutes. I don't want to keep you too long. You're an hour ahead of me. It's getting kind of late. So I just want yeah. to say I really appreciate you taking the time to hop on with me. And uh, I love your guys' stuff and I'm going to continue to use the hell out of it. So. Appreciate all your guys' support, that's for sure. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on, and thanks for asking some fun questions. It's been good. <laughs>